Recording in progress. And at this point, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Scott Roberts. Scott Roberts, PhD, is a professor of health behavior and health education at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, where he directs a certificate program in public health genetics and co-directs a dual master's degree program in public health and genetic counseling. Dr. Roberts conducts research related to health education and support services in Alzheimer's dementia and has served since 2001 as co-PI of the NIH Reveal funded REVEAL study. And again, that's an NIH funded series of randomized clinical trials evaluating the impact of disclosing genetic risk information to individuals with a family history of Alzheimer's dementia. Prior to coming to the University of Michigan, Dr. Roberts served as co-director of the Education Corps and the NIA funded Boston University Alzheimer's Disease Center. And he now directs the MADC's Outreach, Recruitment and Education Corps. So welcome Dr. Roberts, thank you so much. And at this point, it is my pleasure to turn it over to you. We will uh, take some questions in the Q&A and uh, have some time at the end for Q&A as well. Great, well, thanks so much, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be with you all this evening. Uh, thanks for taking time out of this uh, sunny afternoon to join us. Um, as Sarah mentioned, um, I've been in this field a, a while now and been working with the Alzheimer's Association about 20 years now, dating back to my time at Boston University Alzheimer's Disease Center. So I'm always happy to support um, their great causes in terms of uh, promoting quality of life for folks living with dementia, as well as trying to provide education. So what I'm gonna to try to do tonight is give you an update on some of the latest and greatest in Alzheimer's disease research. And uh, because um, I'll be talking about some commercial products, uh, it's always good to disclose one's potential um, conflicts. And unfortunately, I, I don't uh, have any financial conflicts, um, but I did wanna let people know um, what uh, institutes uh, support my research. Um, and just to give you an overview of what I'm going to cover tonight, uh, we'll be talking about uh, an opening section. We'll cover the background and public health significance of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. And then I'll move into talking about research findings in uh, four areas you see listed there. Um, and then uh, that'll be kind of the meat of the presentation. And then we'll close by letting you all know of some research opportunities uh, locally and nationally if you and uh, and or those you uh, work with uh, have any interest in participating in research yourself. And then as Sarah mentioned, we'll have some time for, for Q&A uh, at the end. And if, but if you have any burning questions as we're going through, hopefully uh, you could also put them in the Q&A section. I'll try to um, attend to them and, and respond to them as I can. All right, so without further ado, let's talk about some uh, background and public health significance here. Uh, and before I jump into some of the uh, statistics that I think are relevant, just want to kind of remind us all that I'll be talking about uh, mostly Alzheimer's disease tonight, but of course, Alzheimer's is just one of many dementias. Dementia is this more umbrella term that's a general term to describe a range of symptoms uh, associated with cognitive impairment. And so some of you may know about other types of dementia like vascular disease or Lewy body dementia, frontal temporal dementia. So even though Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia, it's certainly not the only one. And um, to make matters even more complicated, sometimes folks um, have multiple um, processes going on in the brain that uh, are both Alzheimer's and other types of pathology. So we call that mixed dementia. So somebody uh, may, may have um, you know, multiple causes to their cognitive impairment. So sometimes I'll, I'll be referring to Alzheimer's in particular. Sometimes I'll be talking about dementia more generally. Uh, so just wanted to get that um, terminology straight up front. Um, and in this opening section, I'll be talking a lot about uh, some of the latest findings from the Alzheimer's Association's annual facts and figures report. So they put this out annually. It's a great resource if you're interested. I've got the URL link there. Um, and so this, um, this uh, report gives you know, kind of a snapshot of where we are and some of the public health related information uh, associated with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but I just, even though I'm gonna be talking about a lot of data and statistics, I just wanna kind of remind us all that behind every data point is usually an individual or family member dealing with this uh, condition. So I don't wanna 
lose sight of that amidst all the, um, the data that I'll, I'll present. And also, um, I'll be talking about some you know, pretty sobering statistics, and hopefully it won't uh, come across too much in a, a doom and gloom kind of way, because of course, people living with Alzheimer's or related dementias you know, still make great contributions. Um, both uh, family members and, and individuals with dementia still you know, find a lot of meaning in, in, in dealing with the disease. So even though I'll be talking about, you know, so I think some, some challenges we face as a society didn't want to lose fact, uh, sight of that uh, fact either. Um, so just to give a little background, Alzheimer's in, in the United States, it's really a, a highly prevalent condition. So we're talking about over 6 million people in the United States are estimated to have uh, dementia of the Alzheimer's type. So that means that one out of every nine older adults currently um, could be said to uh, have Alzheimer's disease dementia. Uh, as you might expect, the vast majority uh, are, are over the age of 75. And uh, interestingly, two thirds are women. So we don't think of Alzheimer's as a women's health issue. We think of things like breast cancer more frequently, but um, given uh, this statistic, and I'll talk about caregiving as well, I think we, you can make the case that Alzheimer's is a, a women's health issue in a lot of ways. Um, when we think more close to home, here in Michigan, we've got almost 200,000 people affected by Alzheimer's and given the rates uh, increasing, uh, we're gonna see even just within a five year span, we expect that number to go up by 30,000 more. And of course, um, this has been a, a period that where we've all been stressed by the, the COVID pandemic, but I think particular for folks living with Alzheimer's, this has posed a lot of challenges just um, from the uh, standpoint of, we've seen uh, deaths from Alzheimer's and related dementias go up dramatically during this time. And that's not to mention the, the challenges that COVID has posed uh, for caregiving as well, particularly those living in, in nursing home or other institutional settings. It's, it's caused a lot of disruptions to you know, families being able to visit. So, so a lot of challenges that we're facing um, as a society uh, related to Alzheimer's disease. And given that baby boomers are moving into older age, these are the projections over time. So if we're not able to find um, means of um, you know, reversing the, the course of the illness, we're going to see the numbers will continue to rise. You can see these uh, projections from over 6 million currently to perhaps even doubling over the next few decades. And I think another factor to, to note here is that the proportion of people with Alzheimer's uh, disease who are in that 85 and above age group is also going to rise. And so you can imagine uh, that that might also create some challenges given that that group often has a lot of other competing medical demands as well. So I um, just wanted to give you that these projections over time that I think again underscores the importance of trying to, to do something on the research end to, to help address uh, these trends. Um, we're also seeing on uh, the facts and figures report that I mentioned had a special section focused on racial and ethnic disparities. And like a lot of other common health conditions in the US, we see some unfortunate disparities by racial and ethnic group and Alzheimer's is no exception. So uh, the latest estimates suggest, for example, that older black Americans are twice as likely as their white counterparts to have Alzheimer's disease and Hispanic Americans also at elevated risk. Um, and, uh, in addition, we're, this report also um, surveyed caregivers and found some troubling findings in terms of experiences of discrimination within the healthcare system. So you can see no matter what the um, uh, racial or ethnic uh, minority group, um, you see relatively common endorsing of, of experiences of, of feeling discriminated against. And so I think we as a healthcare system need to take these uh, data into account and try to think about how can we respond with um, more uh, culturally sensitive care, uh, whether it's dealing with Native Americans, Blacks, Hispanics, Asian Americans. Um, and I think part of the challenge here is that these groups also experience more barriers to care, whether it's access to, to specialty medical care, whether it's um, having good health insurance. Uh, these are, are factors that we also know contribute to, to health disparities. Uh, and as a result of some of these uh, issues, I think we see that some uh, racial and ethnic minority groups are less likely to seek out care in the first place, or if they do uh, seek care, it's often uh, 
uh, the diagnosis is made in a later stage of the disease. So certainly a lot of work to do, not just in Alzheimer's, but uh, you know, a lot of other health conditions to try to address these racial disparities. Um, thinking about uh, caregiving issues, uh, I know some of you may be uh, either current or, or former caregivers of a loved one with dementia. We know that, um, that, that the caregivers do so much uh, important work uh, and you can see there's estimated over 11 million in the United States today. Uh, the vast majority, about two thirds, live in the community with the person with dementia and about that same proportion are women. And so uh, again, this, this issue of, of gender comes up. Uh, about 30% are age 65 and above, and so then therefore may be dealing uh, with uh, their own uh, health challenges sometimes. And about a quarter are in this dual role of what we call the sandwich generation. So about 25% of caregivers are not just providing care for an older adult with dementia, but they're also raising children themselves. And so they're often uh, in, in a challenging uh, situation given that dual role. Um, and as you, many of you know, uh, caregivers do yeoman's work providing you know, all kinds of, of care and support and often uh, you know, very much uh, see it as part of their role as a, as a family member. Uh, but we certainly know that it can take uh, a toll in terms of emotional costs, health costs, and, and financial costs. And so uh, I think that's uh, important to keep in mind. And when we think about uh, cost to society, uh, this chart here shows that uh, it's estimated that, that Alzheimer's and other dementias account for over $350 billion in, in medical costs. So really um, a, a dramatic uh, number there, and you can see some of the reasons why. So whether we're talking about publicly funded programs like Medicare or Medicaid, or we're talking about out-of-pocket expenses, uh, you, you can see that um, the costs certainly are uh, significant. But uh, fortunately, I think uh, we as a society have recognized the need to try to address many of the concerns that I'm raising here. And so on the more positive side, we're seeing investment at the federal level in research to try to improve things uh, for people with Alzheimer's disease. So thanks to the advocacy efforts of groups like the Alzheimer's Association, you can see this is a chart that shows research funding at the National Institutes of Health which is the major funder of Alzheimer's research. And you can see the dramatic rise just in the past decade, um, where right now uh, the current NIH budget allocates over $3 billion uh, for Alzheimer's research. So that's um, an exciting development and a lot of great work uh, is going on that I'll be talking about tonight. Um, and, uh, but I think we also have to keep in mind, uh, it's, research doesn't you know, provide overnight success stories. Uh, when you think about Alzheimer's compared to some other really important health conditions like cancer or HIV AIDS, you can see that even though we've had this dramatic recent upsurge, uh, some of these other conditions we've seen major investments uh, for, at NIH over a matter of decades, whether it was President Nixon declaring war on cancer back in 1970 that kicked off you know, major investment in, in cancer research and then in 1980 saw a dramatic increase in HIV AIDS. So uh, hopefully this investment that we're seeing now in Alzheimer's will start to pay the kinds of dividends we've seen in those other conditions where we now have much uh, more improved treatment options uh, than we did a, a few decades ago. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of background on some of these you know, big picture issues from a public health standpoint uh, and the challenges that, that Alzheimer's represents. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit now, talk more about imaging and biomarker research, which has been a really active area. And just as a little bit of background here, what you might wonder, well, what do you mean exactly by biomarkers? Well, in Alzheimer's disease, the classic biomarkers uh, that some of you may know about are these what we call plaques and tangles. And you can see this image uh, shows what they might look like under the microscope. These are the classic features of Alzheimer's in the brain that Dr. Alzheimer's himself back in 1906 identified. So the amyloid plaques are, uh, you know, start to accumulate uh, in the brain early in this process. And then these neurofibrillary tangles that you can also see made of a protein called tau, those are the classic symptoms uh, of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, 
Uh, and it used to be that we could only detect them after somebody had died and you did a brain autopsy. But through some recent um, developments in, in technology, we're now able to detect these and other biomarkers uh, you know, while the, the person with dementia is, is still alive. And so when I talk about other types of biomarkers, I'm thinking about things like bra uh, brain inflammation, uh, or, or we might have heard of certain types of what we call neurodegeneration. So for example, certain uh, parts of the brain may see some uh, kind of shrinking or atrophy over time in, in regions of the brain like the hippocampus. Um, and so these are the things that I think scientists are very interested in being able to identify and track over time because these biomarkers might uh, correlate with um, you know, the severity of the disease that a patient is experiencing. And we can assess biomarkers in a variety of ways. So I mentioned the one way would be uh, at death to do a brain autopsy, but of course there's many other ways too. Uh, some exciting neuroimaging techniques like a PET scan or MRI that some of you may know about. You can also, um, using um, a lumbar puncture, you can actually in inject a needle in the, in the lower back and, and extract cerebrospinal fluid. So that's another way of being able to um, get a sample where you could detect biomarkers. And really excitingly, we're seeing the advent of blood-based biomarkers. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, that, but that's, that, as you might imagine, is a much more um, cost-effective way of being able to, to detect uh, biomarkers for Alzheimer's. And so what's happened in the course of research is, if you see this graph here, this kind of shows the continuum of Alzheimer's disease where people might progress from having no symptoms whatsoever all the way through to having severe dementia. Uh, and so most research to date has been done uh, in this kind of more right-hand uh, side of the picture in that where people have you know, full-fledged dementia with symptoms that are interfering with their activities. But we're seeing more and more the ability to identify biomarkers in people who may have what we call mild cognitive impairment. So they have very mild symptoms that don't actually really impair their functioning in a meaningful way. Uh, and we're even seeing this new category called preclinical Alzheimer's, where people are cognitively totally normal, but we can start to detect some things going on in their brain that may herald uh, the onset of an Alzheimer's disease process. And so in that preclinical space is where we're trying to move towards to intervene, because the, the hope is that by intervening much earlier in the disease process, we may have a better chance of perhaps even preventing the disease before any symptoms uh, occur. That's the, I think, the dream here. Um, so over time, because of the development of these biomarkers, we've seen this model emerge that might be called the amyloid cascade model. And so the idea here is that there is a predictable sequence of events that occurs in the brain when we're talking about Alzheimer's disease. And that accumulation of those amyloid plaques that I mentioned earlier, that's kind of the first stage. Uh, and then you can see how things might move through other processes in the brain, like inflammation uh, might occur next. And then ultimately we start to see some of those tau tangles that I talked about start to develop. And then ultimately we start to see um, you know, cells um, dying and, and having the loss of neurochemicals and, and nerve cells in the brain. So this is the, at least a the theory, and you know, it's open for some debate because um, it's, it's not totally uh, worked out how all of this uh, goes. And of course, people might vary from, from one to another. But the thought has been, if we can interrupt this process, particularly early on, perhaps we're gonna have a better chance of, of having improved treatments for the disease. So there's been a lot of focus on um, especially at this amyloid stage, can we develop these anti-amyloid agents that might be able to avoid uh, that deposition of amyloid plaques in the brain? So that's, I think, some of the, um, the, uh, the hope of, of this kind of a, a approach. So there's a, looks like there's a question in the chat, what are the marker differences between preclinical and MCI? And uh, that's a good question. I think some of these markers may be present in both. And so they don't always map on to how someone is actually functioning in real life. 
So you could have someone who has a significant amount of amyloid in their brain, and they're still doing just fine. They wouldn't even be considered having mild cognitive impairment, whereas you might have another person with amyloid who does have some of those memory problems. So the challenge here is that just the presence of the biomarker itself doesn't neatly map onto how someone is faring in terms of their memory or other cognitive functioning. And so I think that's uh, you know, some of the challenges that the biomarkers themselves don't uh, always correlate to, to how someone is faring uh, in terms of their everyday activities. But we know that with enough of this, with enough amyloid, enough tau, enough inflammation, that ultimately you will start to see cognitive symptoms uh, over time. Um, so let's talk a little bit about amyloid because there's been so much focus on that. So one um, development in the field has been this uh, use of amyloid imaging that some of you may know about. And you can see this image here shows that uh, we can now use these PET scans as usually the, the technology that's used to be able to identify whether amyloid is present in the brain to a significant degree and, and where in the brain it is occurring. So what happens is uh, a radio tracer is injected into the bloodstream. The person goes into the scanner, as you can see in this image. Uh, and then ultimately that uh, radio tracer ends up binding to amyloid if it's present in the brain and then it shows up on the PET scan image. And so this was a major breakthrough and the FDA actually approved this technology back uh, almost a decade ago uh, for use in people with cognitive impairment. And right now it's not used a lot in clinical practice uh, because, and I'll talk about some of the reasons why, but it is uh, used sometimes to help assist with what we call a differential diagnosis. So a physician, for example, might know that someone has significant cognitive impairment they know that a dementia is present, but they're trying to figure out, well, what type is it? Is it Alzheimer's? Is it Lewy body? Is it vascular? And here's where this amyloid imaging might be useful because if significant amyloid is present, that might lead the physician to lean more towards an Alzheimer's diagnosis. And if it's not, it might lead them to think about other uh, causes of the dementia. So right now it's not recommended for clinical use with people who have no cognitive symptoms. Um, but it is used some um, with folks who do have cognitive impairment. Although we do have a, a study that I'm part of that where we've actually offered this on a research basis to people without cognitive impairment who are just interested in learning what their amyloid status is. Um, so I mentioned that it's not used frequently in clinical care. Uh, Medicare has uh, held back on funding this because they you know, as you might imagine, this is a pretty expensive technology. So they have not wanted to cover this automatically for fear that, you know, healthcare costs would rise dramatically. They were interested in first, you know, finding evidence, is this really going to be useful clinically? Um, and so um, the, uh, the thought here is that if we can do some research to try to um, demonstrate whether it's useful clinically, uh, then that would maybe help guide coverage decisions uh, and, and Medicare. And it looks like there's a question, is an amyloid deposition in the brain commonly in the elderly irrespective of Alzheimer's? And so um, that is absolutely true. And as I'll point out, uh, many people have amyloid that might show up on a scan like this and they never go on to develop Alzheimer's or related dementia. So um, it's not, even though it's necessary for an Alzheimer's diagnosis, it's not always sufficient. Uh, but I think if you do have something that's going on where you definitely know that there is a dementia present, for example, you've been able to document that there's been slow but steady cognitive decline over time, uh, and it's really impairing the person's functioning, uh, and then you do the scan and you see significant amyloid Again, that might not be a slam dunk that um, it's absolutely Alzheimer's, but I think it would increase your, your confidence. And of course, the scan would just be one piece of a diagnostic evaluation. That, that information would be used with other types of information. For example, maybe neuropsych testing would be done to, um, to see how, you know, what a person's memory or, or cognitive functioning. You'd wanna maybe talk to the caregiver to find out how the person is doing. So uh, I think um, that's, uh, that's an important point to keep in mind that it's not just, you know, you just do the test and you make the diagnosis exclusively 
on the basis of that. Uh, and here's a, it looks like another question. Do any amyloid antibodies have an effect? And I'll, I'll talk about that because there's, that's a very active area uh, of investigation, clinical trials. So hold on tight. I'll get to that in my clinical trials section. Well, let's talk about um, the, uh, this IDEA study. So the idea behind this study was to um, take a look at uh, the use of amyloid PET imaging in real life practice. So they did a major study of over 18,000 patients who had some kind of dementia, but the physicians, again, were trying to figure out what's the underlying cause. And so they found that use of amyloid imaging did seem to inform medical management. So it did seem to make a difference in the kinds of medications that the physician was prescribing or not prescribing, and it made a difference in the diagnosis that was made. So for example, uh, those who got a negative scan so that, that found that amyloid was not significantly present, it often did change the diagnosis. So it was maybe the provisional diagnosis was Alzheimer's, but then the negative amyloid scan uh, made the physician go in another direction in terms of the diagnosis that they provided. And as a result too, sometimes then maybe you would not use certain medications that are, that are approved for Alzheimer's disease um, as a result. Uh, unfortunately, though, they did not see any significant impact on these more downstream uh, outcomes like hospitalizations or ER uh, benefits. Um, and uh, okay, I'm getting a, a question here that looks like one person has a hand raised. Uh, so um, Chris Jensen, you're, you're on to, to ask your question. Looks like you might be muted, Chris. Are you able to unmute? Oh, there we go. There. Yeah, that was a mistake. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no the worries. Hand, raised hand was a mistake. Not a problem. No problem. And yeah, I'm happy to, uh, hopefully I'm doing an okay job of trying to keep up with the chat and Q&A. So uh, we can try to keep doing that as we go here, because I certainly don't want to just drone on and on. I want to make this uh, somewhat interactive. Um, so back to the idea study. So it was kind of, again, mixed results here. Some evidence that it's useful in certain areas like informing diagnosis or medical management, but in terms of ultimately uh, some of these patient outcomes that we care about after diagnosis, there, there didn't seem to be a significant uh, impact. So there's a, a new idea study that's being launched that'll hopefully uh, provide some additional information and maybe again, ultimately help uh, Medicare decide whether they're gonna truly cover this and under what conditions they would cover this kind of imaging. Um, another kind of imaging, as you might expect, given that I've talked about um, amyloid is, is tau imaging. So a similar concept as an amyloid imaging, again, using PET scan technology, again, trying to you know, have a, a tracer that's injected that shows up on a PET scan image. And you can see a versus B here, the B would be the positive scan and you know, where it's showing the presence of, of tau tangles throughout the brain in this particular case. Uh, so tau imaging is a much newer kit on the block. Um, it's mostly been done on a research basis only to date, but we did see the FDA just last year approve it uh, for clinical use um, using this agent called uh, flortausapir. Um, and so I think we're going to start seeing it used uh, more often, and it's already being integrated into some of the clinical trials that I'll be talking about. So that's been an important development. Uh, and another really important development is this idea of, can we actually detect amyloid and tau through a blood-based biomarker? Could we just do a basic blood test and still get some of this information without having to do the fancy expensive PET scan? And so just last year, we saw some dramatic findings reported at the big Alzheimer's International Conference, where this one biomarker known as PTAU217 uh, seems to be very sensitive and specific in detecting um, signs of Alzheimer's disease. And so the, the impressive thing here was it wasn't just one group finding this. These were researchers from all over both the US and Europe uh, looking at populations uh, in, in different contexts. There was a really interesting study in South America uh, where they, had, they were following folks who you know, had a rare genetic mutation that uh, inevitably causes the disease, and they were finding that the biomarker was performing well 
in that population in, in being able to detect early signs of, of tau uh, in, in the brain. And so this uh, is really, I, I think, an exciting breakthrough because this might ultimately be used, for example, maybe as a screening tool because it can be done relatively cheaply and easily when you're talking just about a blood test. And so the thought is that maybe ultimately we could even see in primary care offices this initial blood test being done. And then if that uh, blood-based biomarker test came back positive, then maybe we start to do more, you know, further investigation uh, with the amyloid and, and tau imaging. So um, stay tuned here. I think the hope is that uh, even though this is right now just being done on a research basis, that before too long we might see this blood test uh, be used in clinical practice as well. Um, so and I, like I mentioned, there was a lot of excitement. I think it probably was the biggest news from the big International Alzheimer's Conference last uh, summer, as you can see from some of these um, news headlines. So, um, and I think all of this is to say, we're really thinking about biomarkers being used ultimately to try to help perhaps even classify Alzheimer's according to different subtypes. So there's this new research framework called the ATN framework, standing for amyloid tau and neurodegeneration. And so depending on whether one is uh, positive or negative for each of those three biomarkers, you can see the different combinations are listed here, um, then uh, perhaps uh, we might ultimately think about tailoring therapy to where people stand in this uh, ATN spectrum. Um, but as someone pointed out in the chat earlier, you could, you, know, you could have some of these biomarkers and still be cognitively normal. And in fact, it's estimated that uh, over 40 million people in the United States uh, would be positive on at least one of these biomarkers. And so, and many of those, of course, would not go on to develop dementia. So we need to be careful about not labeling people um, and assuming that just because they have the president's of a biomarker that they're, they're going to go on and have dementia. So I think there'll be some interesting challenges here, but uh, just trying to give you a feel for some of the excitement around biomarkers and how they might ultimately be used in, in practice. So let me, um, let me shift gears here uh, just a little bit, although there'll be some continuity because again, these biomarkers are being used in a lot of clinical trials, both to identify at-risk groups who might uh, take part in trials and also to monitor the progress uh, of disease over time. So when we talk about clinical trials, uh, just to remind folks, uh, if, or maybe to educate you, uh, when we think about clinical trials and a drug that's trying to get you know, approval from the government for use, uh, we talk about them in, in usually three main phases. So you can see listed here, you know, the phase one is usually just kind of a very small initial trial uh, and basically the goal there would just be to see, is this drug safe? And is it safe at what dose? Um, and so not so much concerned with, is it efficacious, but just, is it safe? And so these studies may not even have like a comparison group, uh, but if they prove that that safety, then uh, a drug might then move on to phase two, where it would be a larger number of participants. It would maybe compare the them um, people who got that drug to a placebo control group who did not get the drug. And then you start to look at, is this a, a beneficial medication? What kind of side effects might occur? Uh, and then let's say for the sake of argument, the phase two trial shows some promising results. Then you move on to the phase three phase where you're, you're trying to think about testing this in a much broader group of patients and looking to try to determine some kind of overall risk benefit ratio. And as you might expect, these phase three trials, because they're much larger, uh, often take uh, several years at a time. And so uh, this is what any drug, Alzheimer's or otherwise, has to go through this process for the FDA to approve it. And so it's a very lengthy, time-consuming, expensive uh, process. And unfortunately, in Alzheimer's, we've seen a lot of medications look good in these early phases, but then when they get to the phase three stage, uh, we haven't had a lot of recent successes. So in fact, it's been almost 20 years since we've had the FDA approve a medication specifically for Alzheimer's. And we've had around 40 negative phase three trials. And you know, some major drug companies have expended billions of dollars in, in conducting this research. And so it's been, I think, frustrating 
for the field that we haven't had more breakthroughs. So this is kind of just a, an overview of to date, we have five FDA approved medications. The first four listed here are what we call cholinesterase inhibitors that some of you may know about like Aricept. Um, and so this is what is currently approved, uh, but we're hoping we can um, have more additions to this uh, lineup because as you probably already know, uh, a lot of these medications, they might provide some temporary relief of, of cognitive symptoms, but they're not necessarily going to you know, reverse the condition over time. And so there's been a lot of active search for new and improved uh, medications uh, to treat Alzheimer's. Uh, and there's been some promise. So some of you may know about aducanumab. And so the earlier question about are the, there are these anti-amyloid therapies? Yes, there are many that are being tested. And aducanumab is one that's uh, what they call uh, an anti-amyloid antibody. So it's actually administered by IV infusion. And you can see from this uh, picture below, um, one of the phase one trials that was done showed some really exciting results. You can see that in that high dose treatment column that somebody was really had a lot of amyloid in their brain on that initial scan. But then after being administered aducanumab, a year later, you see a lot less amyloid showing up. So it seemed that this drug was being effective in clearing amyloid plaques from the brain. But then the big question is, well, what does that do in terms of someone's actual cognitive functioning? And that's where um, it hasn't necessarily automatically resulted in, oh, all of a sudden someone is, is dramatically different cognitively, even though this amyloid has been removed from the brain. So the aducanumab story, is a, it's been kind of a roller coaster ride. Some of you may, may know some of these details. So those findings I was just talking about were back in 2016, where they saw some promising early results that uh, in these MCI and mild AD cases, we were seeing uh, the amyloid being cleared from the brain. On the other hand, they were also showing some safety concerns to it, particularly at the higher doses. There were some, some participants were experiencing uh, these, these micro hemorrhages that were not, not fatal, but were certainly you know, a cause for, for concern. Um, but it was promising enough that they then, after that phase 1B trial was conducted, they started to, ultimately, they did some phase 2, and then these phase 3 trials were launched called Emerge and Engage. Um, but then in 2019, we got the disappointing news that uh, Biogen, which is the company uh, that was producing aducanumab, ended the trials early because their data was suggesting that this was not an efficacious treatment. So they did not want to put you know, research trial participants through any additional risk. And so it seemed that that might be the end of the story. But then lo and behold, I guess a Biogen continued to analyze some of their data and they found that in one particular trial, the eMERGE trial, within one particular subgroup, the high, you know, some of the people receiving this higher dose, they did find that that group seemed to be showing some uh, less decline over time than the placebo control group. So on the basis of that, Biogen said, hey, wait a minute, we actually don't want to stop our trials and we want to um, see if we can get FDA to approve our medication on the basis of this new data. Um, and so they ended up, the FDA did allow uh, Biogen to proceed and actually relaunch some of their, their study of participants, so to go back and, and follow some of the, the trial participants. Um, but ultimately, just this past November, they convened their advisory committee to take a look at the data, and uh, they concluded that they didn't think the uh, evidence was impressive enough um, that they should recommend it be approved. And so, um, even though this is not a binding uh, decision, so the FDA does not have to always follow the advice of its advisory committees, it did seem to be notable that the advisory committee uh, was, um, was saying we should not approve this, this medication. Uh, but that, that's not the total end of the story. Uh, the FDA has continued to, to uh, request data from Biogen, and I think the final decision ex is expected in early June. So just a few weeks from now, uh, you should probably uh, check your, your news reports. We'll probably be hearing something one way or the other from the FDA about whether aducanumab is going to be 
uh, approved or not. Um, another type of an anti-amyloid antibody, uh, not uh, aducanumab, but this one's called denanumab. We just, uh, just a couple months ago saw a phase two trial report in the New England Journal of Medicine that had some promising news. So you can see this graph here shows that participants who are in that treatment arm, you can see their decline on this, something called the IADRS. This is a measure of both cognitive and functional impairment. You see those IADRS scores, they continue to decline, but at a much uh, lower rate than the placebo control group. So they followed these folks out to 76 weeks after uh, starting the therapy. Uh, and there seemed that these, these groups did to seem to be different. And so that was enough evidence to suggest that we should move to phase three trials with denanumab. So that's another medication to keep your eye on. But again, it's not like these folks on denanumab are just staying totally stable over the course of several years. They're still having some decline but it just seems to be uh, a less dramatic slope than in the placebo group. Um, and so those are some trials where we're, again, we're talking about folks who have either early Alzheimer's disease, dementia, or mild cognitive impairment. You might be aware that there are some other trials going on that are actually trying to test medications in people who have no cognitive symptoms but who might be at high risk on the basis of their genetics or on the basis of their amyloid status. And so these are just a, a few of the ones that you may have heard about. And, and for most of these, we're still waiting to hear uh, what the news is. Uh, and so we're still waiting to, to have some of the, the findings from these trials. Um, so, so stay tuned to see what some of these prevention trials uh, will say about the... But again, a lot of these have really continued to be focused on anti-amyloid therapies. And so some people have suggested, well, are we putting too many eggs in the amyloid basket? Should we be thinking uh, about uh, anti-tau uh, treatments or other kinds of approaches beyond just focusing on, on amyloid? Um, one major prevention trial that's actually underway right now that we're actually recruiting for at our Michigan site is called the AHEAD study. So this is a study that, again, is uh, taking an anti-amyloid antibody approach. It's uh, expanded the age range. Most uh, clinical trials are just looking at 65 and older, but uh, in these trials, they're looking at 55 and above. And so there's two related trials. And the, to be eligible for these, you have to show some sign of elevated amyloid on that PET scan that I was talking about earlier. Uh, and, and so it can be either at this intermediate range or at a more significant level. Uh, so depending on the, the presence of, of amyloid, you might be eligible for this A3 trial versus this A4-5 trial. But in both trials, they're going to be testing anti-amyloid therapies, following people for four or more years to see whether these can stave off potential symptoms of Alzheimer's disease in people who are cognitively normal when they enter the study. Um, Looks like uh, I've got a question about drugs to decrease the concentration of acetylcholine actually increase the, de the decline. Um, I don't know for sure there. I know that I mentioned some of the older drugs that are FDA approved are these cholinesterase inhibitors. Um, and so my sense is that oftentimes they may not be effective in improving cognition but actually worsening decline, I don't think we usually see that, but we may see other reasons why people might not want to um, the, uh, continue on that because it may have other side effects uh, as well. Uh, so if you're not gonna see an, a, a cognitive benefit, but then you're seeing you know, the drug is causing things like you know, nausea or, or excessive sleepiness or sleep problems, things like that, uh, then uh, people often will discontinue the medication because of some of those uh, side effects. So um, this AHEAD study, I think, is interesting uh, in that uh, the, um, we'll see how, how these go. But again, this is kind of part of this trend of um, prevention trials, again, trying to prevent symptoms before they even occur. And I think uh, the future, again, I'm not a physician myself, so I need to be careful here about going too far outside of my lane. But um, I think the hope is that ultimately, I, I think a lot of experts believe 
that it'll be like a lot of other conditions where, again, you're not relying on just one approach. So you might see multiple medications being prescribed, each with a different kind of purpose, you know, targeting a different kind of process in the brain. And so it may be that we see people are being prescribed you know, some of the currently approved therapies, uh, in addition to some of these disease modifying therapies that are under investigation. Uh, on top of those, you might see other uh, drugs that might be used to deal with some of the psychiatric symptoms of, of dementia as well. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how this emerges, but some have suggested that ultimately they expect it to be some kind of uh, combination of approaches. All right, well, let's shift uh, gears from um, clinical trials to talk more about risk and protective factors, because I think a lot of people are often interested in you know, what, uh, what might put people at risk or help reduce risk? And is there anything I can do myself to reduce my risk? Uh, unfortunately, there are some well-known risk factors that we can't really do much about. And, and I think many of you probably already know these, but of course, older age is, is prominent among those. So you can see the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease in the uh, 85 and up group is, is much uh, greater than in the 65 to 74 group. You can see almost uh, 10 times greater. Um, I mentioned women being at elevated risk earlier. So um, female sex does seem to be a modest risk factor. Uh, some people have wondered, oh, well, it's just, just because women tend to live longer than men on average. And I think even though we don't know exactly why, there's some suggestion that it might be more than just an artifact of that longer lifespan. Uh, and of course, genetics is important as many of you uh, may know. So let me just say a little bit more about the genetics of Alzheimer's disease. So there are um, some rare genetic mutations that almost inevitably cause Alzheimer's disease. And if you've ever seen the film Still Alice with Julianne Moore winning an Oscar for her portrayal of a woman uh, affected in her 50s from Alzheimer's disease, she had one of these uh, subtypes that we call familial Alzheimer's. And it's caused by these rare genetic mutations that are you know, passed down from one generation to the next. Luckily, these are rare. So most Alzheimer's cases are not caused by these genetic mutations. But uh, as I alluded to, people who do have these uh, genetic uh, variants do often develop Alzheimer's in decades earlier than we usually see it. Uh, and on top of that, we often see it's a more rapid disease course, so the symptoms um, develop more quickly over time. So in those cases, we do have um, genetic testing and counseling that are available. If, you, if there's a family history that seems to indicate that this might be present, uh, people can be tested to see if they have these uh, rare genetic mutations. But again, the um, genetics that's perhaps relevant to more of the general population is not these rare mutations, but more this, uh, the prominent risk factor that's been known about for a while is this APOE gene that some of you may have heard about, standing for apolipoprotein E. So APOE is a gene that's found on chromosome 19, and we all have an APOE genotype, and it's constituted by uh, alleles that we inherit from each of our parents. So uh, the common alleles are, are called E2, E3, and E4. And so we each inherit um, an APOE allele from our mom and our dad. And as a result, there are six possible genotypes. And if we happen to inherit uh, the variant that's known as E4, that can put us at elevated risk for Alzheimer's. So this E4 is a well-established risk factor. Uh, and it's interestingly, E4 is also a modest risk factor for heart disease as well. So um, here's just a look at genotypes in the general population. Uh, you can see that about a quarter of the general population has at least one of those risk alleles, that E4, and about 2% of the general population has an E4, E4 genotype, meaning that they've inherited a risk allele from each parent. Um, and so E4, this might give you a clear sense of what does it mean in terms of risk. In the general population, it's estimated that about 10 to 15% of people ultimately develop Alzheimer's disease. But you can see if you have an E4 allele, that uh, risk goes up uh, modestly here. And if you have two E4 alleles, you can see it goes up uh, more dramatically to perhaps even over 50% chance of developing Alzheimer's. Uh, on the other hand, 
just because you have kind of like we were talking about with amyloid, just because you have an E4 risk allele does not mean you will inevitably develop Alzheimer's. So it's, uh, it's what we say, it's neither necessary nor sufficient to cause it because you can have Alzheimer's and be an E3, E3 genotype, or you could also be E4, E4 and never go on to develop the disease. But you can see from these statistics though that it is a notable risk factor. And so as a result, a lot of people are interested in learning what their genetic risk is. And so even though this is not generally done in clinical practice, there have been companies like 23andMe that you may have heard of that uh, have won FDA approval of providing direct-to-consumer APOE testing. So it's been controversial in the genetics world. In the genetics world, they feel like if you're going to get genetic testing, you should meet with a genetic counselor or some kind of medical professional to talk through it. But 23andMe has said, well, we can detect APOE just using a simple you know, spit in a tube and send it back to us. So why not try to educate the broader public? So there's, there's a lot of interesting debates over, is it appropriate to be doing this kind of testing outside of a medical context? Um, but for better or for worse, we've seen for the past few years um, this kind of testing being available through companies like 23andMe. Um, so that's a little bit on genetics, uh, but let's focus now more on things that one could do to lower risk of Alzheimer's or related dementias. So you can see from this Lancet Commission report, that's a you know international body of experts, they came together and they provided this report where they were suggesting, you can see these bullet points here, there's a lot of things that might be done to lower one's chances uh, of, of dementia. And some of these are, are things that are just good for us to do anyway, right? That we know for all kinds of health conditions, it's probably good, for example, to be physically active, to try to um, stop smoking. These are things that of course can reduce risk of all kinds of, of conditions. Uh, and so some of, and some conditions that in and of themselves are risk factors for, for dementia, like diabetes or, or hypertension. Um, and interestingly, some of these are, are, are more kind of mental health related, like depression or excessive alcohol use. Uh, and interestingly, uh, hearing impairment made the, this list of the, the Lancet uh, Commission report. And we know that hearing impairment is surprisingly common among older adults and surprisingly uh, untreated in a lot of cases, but there's some suggestion that treating hearing impairment may actually uh, help improve people's what we call cognitive reserve and maybe lower chances of, of developing dementia. So there's a lot of things that, that could uh, be done from a public health standpoint to try to lower risk of dementia. And so the Lancet group looked at these numbers and they, they said, if we could modify all 12 of these risk factors, we could potentially prevent or delay up to 40% of all dementia cases. So that was pretty uh, dramatic. Uh, but on the other hand, it shows you can be doing all these things right. You can be leading a, a very healthy lifestyle and there's 60% of dementia cases that would not be touched by even doing all of these uh, great things here. So I think that's important to keep in mind because we don't want to get to a point where we you know, blame people. Oh, if they'd only led a healthier lifestyle then they wouldn't have got an Alzheimer's disease. It's certainly not the kind of condition where we should, we should think about it in those terms. Um, yeah, and it looks like in the chat, there's uh, this book called The End of Alzheimer's Disease. Yeah, that's a controversial book. I think Dr. Bredesen is, knows a lot, but I think depending on who you talk to, some feel like he maybe oversells some of his, his findings. But, uh, but yeah, there's some of these, uh, I think that's a good point in general. Some of these, uh, there is de active debate over just how helpful would it be to do these things in terms of, of dementia risk reduction? There's, there's not always definitive studies. A lot of times it's just more these observational studies where these conclusions are drawn. But given that a lot of these things, like I mentioned, are just good to do anyway, it's probably not controversial to suggest that someone stops smoking, for example. Um, I did want to highlight exercise, though, because I think there really is a pretty robust uh, set of, of studies that suggest that exercise is is very useful for uh, cognitive functioning. Um, and so they, this has come from both epidemiological studies that have found kind of an association between physical activity and lower risk of cognitive decline. And now that we're starting to see some intervention studies that are showing the benefits of physical activity. So for example, in these trials, they've looked at people's um, 
the volume of their hippocampus on a brain scan, or they, they test people's memory functioning, and they're finding that these uh, people in these, these trials are looking better uh, on those different outcomes when they're engaged in regular, moderate to vigorous uh, physical exercise. And just as a reminder, the federal guidelines in this uh, realm suggest that we should all be aiming for around 150 minutes a week of aerobic activity. And so even though I'm in this field, I have to admit that there are many weeks where I do not achieve that goal. So it's one thing to, to know what's good for us, another thing to put it into action. But I think physical activity is, uh, is really important. And of course, it has a lot of other benefits too, just uh, in terms of physical health, mood, et cetera. Um, diet, uh, I didn't, was not mentioned in that Lancet report, but I think there's been some interesting recent studies suggesting about the benefits for brain health of, of healthy diet. Uh, you can, and there's a lot of reasons why. Uh, you can see this list here uh, of helping uh, maintain good blood pressure, uh, getting antioxidants, uh, keeping uh, a healthy microbiome, that is, you know, the bacteria in our gut. Um, and just uh, recently, there was an interesting German study that looked at people who were uh, adherent to what's called the Mediterranean diet, and it found that that group uh, had a better chance of uh, having higher memory functioning, and they actually also studied these folks uh, using um, brain scans and found that, that adherence to the Mediterranean diet actually had lower levels of amyloid and tau in the brain. So that was an interesting uh, recent finding. So the Mediterranean diet, of course, has been looked at a lot in the context of lowering risk for heart disease, but uh, there's some suggestion it may also have benefits from a cognitive standpoint. And here's just some of the basic recommendations from the Mediterranean diet. Uh, and, and some of these, you don't even have to say you're following a Mediterranean diet to, to eat more fruits and vegetables, for example. Um, but the, the basic premise is trying to maybe replace some of these uh, unhealthy foods that a lot of us are tempted by with some of these healthier alternatives listed on the right here. And so um, the Mediterranean diet is, is an intervention that's been studied a lot uh, that you might want to check out more if this uh, is, is appealing to you. Interestingly, there's been some recent data also suggesting that sleep quality might be important for later life cognitive functioning. So there was just a major study out of the UK that showed that folks who were able to sleep, you know, kind of in this more seven to eight hours of sleep a night range, they had a much, this, this kind of solid line is the main uh, thing to point out here on this graph that kind of corresponds to higher risk of dementia is on this x-axis here. So you can see significantly higher risk of dementia for those who are just getting you know, four or five hours of sleep a night compared to a little bit more. And again, these are group means. So if you're one of these people who does great on five hours of sleep, it's not that you should automatically try to, try to get more. But on the whole, uh, at, the, at the group level, it seemed to be that uh, this uh, greater amount of sleep did seem to have these restorative uh, effects on the brain uh, over time. And there's been other studies that have looked at this as well, not just this one UK study. Uh, so kind of a, a reminder of us to try to attend to, to what you might call sleep hygiene. Um, one risk factor where we really are just in the early days of not knowing what the long-term effects are gonna be is of course COVID-19. And so uh, there are some suggestions that uh, you know, a lot of people are dealing what we call long COVID, having kind of you know, maybe symptoms over a long period of time. So it's really unknown what longer term cognitive impact COVID-19 might have, but the Alzheimer's Association uh, has partnered with the WHO to try to start a long, large international uh, study in this area, again, following people out up to 18 months time. So we'll be interesting to see what, uh, what that line of research shows. So um, hopefully this gives you a, a little bit of feel of, of what's happening in this realm of risk and protective factors uh, for Alzheimer's and, and other uh, dementias. Um, but let's talk about uh, studies that have actually tried to put some of these protective factors into action as part of a formal intervention. So uh, you'll be happy to know that the NIH funds not, I mean, I've talked some about drug trials, but there's a lot of work going on on all kinds of non-pharmacological interventions. And, you know, I've talked about diet, exercise, sleep, 
There's cognitive training studies that are happening. Uh, there's neurostimulation studies. There, there's a whole range of, of, of intervention trials that are going on, uh, as well as caregiver-focused interventions too. So um, I've got this link here. So there's over 200 federally funded intervention studies in, in just these realms alone. So again, it's an exciting time, I think, in terms of uh, intervention research. Um, some of these intervention trials have been focused on this premise of, you know, what's good for the heart is good for the brain. That's been kind of a slogan that's been uh, adopted in, in recent years, given that uh, both heart disease and dementia share a lot of common risk factors. Um, so there was this one study recently called the Sprint Mind Trial that tried to look at, might there be benefits from an intervention to try to control hypertension? So in this study, they looked at, you know, the standard approach is to try to keep people uh, at a level of systolic blood pressure of under 140. But in this intervention arm, they tried to either through medications or lifestyle modifications, see if they could get that blood pressure down even further. And so it was a very large study of over 9,000 older adults who had elevated risk for heart disease. Uh, and by pursuing this more intensive management of hypertension, they found that in that intervention arm, they had a significantly lower risk of developing mild cognitive impairment. So a 19% lower risk of going on to have mild cognitive impairment compared to the standard care group. So that was very exciting. And again, it shows that there might be some benefits from managing hypertension in terms of ultimate uh, risk of dementia. And so now there's a, a follow-up trial to try to extend these findings to see but what happens if we intervene people who, who have mild cognitive impairment? Could we actually lower their chances of then going on to develop dementia itself? So we'll see uh, how they fare with this uh, approach. Uh, and then uh, for a few years now, we've known about this approach uh, pioneered by people in Finland as part of a study called the FINGER study. And so what they've done in this trial is they've actually used uh, a variety of approaches all at once. So they focused on diet through nutritional guidance. They've focused on physical exercise. They're using cognitive training to try to you know, use some computer games to keep people sharp. And then again, they're also monitoring uh, these risk factors for vascular disease. So uh, they found by using this combination approach, they've had some promising results in that the intervention group is looking better than the control group in a, in a variety of cognitive domains. And so based on those initial findings, we're now seeing this finger approach being used worldwide. And so there's a whole range of studies undergoing uh, in, in 25 different countries world, worldwide, where again, they're all using variations on this uh, multi-component intervention to try to see, can it uh, lower risk of, of dementia? And uh, the US, of course, is part of the picture here with the support of the Alzheimer's Association. So. Um, they're part of this network. Uh, and in the US, they call it the pointer study. So I've got the link here for you. Um, and so it's a two year randomized trial um, where they're again using this multi component approach using these four different types of, of intervention all in one um, to see what kind of benefits it might uh, uh, result in. And so recruitment is now underway at six sites nationally. Unfortunately, nothing right here in our backyard. I guess Chicago does have two sites. Uh, but we'll see what uh, this study shows in terms of this kind of more lifestyle uh, intervention approach as opposed to focusing on you know, those anti-amyloid medications I was mentioning earlier. Um, so there's a lot, I guess, that to, to sum up, there's a lot of things that one could potentially do to reduce risk of Alzheimer's and related dementias. And again, there's no magic bullet. It's not a guarantee that any of these is gonna for sure make sure that you'll never develop Alzheimer's. On the other hand, they can certainly lower your chances. And they're also, as I've alluded to a couple of times, just probably good for us no matter what. Um, and so the Alzheimer's Association has a website called 10 Ways to Love Your Brain. So if you're interested in learning more, you might want to check that out. And a lot of the, the issues I've mentioned here are part of what they're recommending uh, in terms of different ways uh, we can, can improve our, our health. Uh, and our brain health. Um, so I wanted to kind of close with just a little bit more kind of food for thought uh, about next steps that, uh, that you might take yourself. 
Um, and so one way is just to kind of continue to, to educate yourself. There's actually some really interesting um, new reading out there that you might want to check out. I mentioned that facts and figures report uh, from the Alzheimer's Association that just came out. Uh, when Since we're talking about brain health, uh, you may have heard of Sanjay Gupta. He's the CNN main medical correspondent. He's actually a University of Michigan alum as well. So he has a new book out called Keep Sharp, Build a Better Brain at Any Age, where he kind of reviews the literature on you know, what does the research show or not show in terms of what might be helpful uh, to stay sharp. And then uh, my friend and colleague, Jason Karlowish at the University of Pennsylvania has a new book out called The Problem of Alzheimer's, where he takes more of kind of a historical perspective on the disease. And he'll actually be here uh, to give a talk in November. And if you're aware of the Literati Bookstore here in town in Ann Arbor, he's gonna be doing a book signing event in November and a you know, very thoughtful uh, geriatrician with the Penn Alzheimer's Center. So some of these might be uh, of interest to you to, and again, they're all written for kind of the educated layperson, so hopefully not too bogged down in, in scientific jargon. Um, I also kind of a sneak preview of coming attractions. The main uh, conference from a scientific standpoint in terms of international Alzheimer's research is sponsored by the Alzheimer's Association. And so that will be taking place in July. So a lot of times, uh, you know, breakthrough findings are reported there. So in July, uh, you might want to keep an eye on, on findings that are presented as part of this conference. Uh, and then closer to home, I wanted to make you aware of what's going on at our center. We have uh, one of about 32 uh, federally funded Alzheimer's disease research centers across the country uh, where we all you know, come together and pool data uh, to try to gain insights into the disease. And so it's exciting to be part of this national network. And so as a result, uh, our center, we, we sponsor a lot of different kinds of studies and try to make people aware of them. And so it's really a wide range of them. Some of them are drug trials, like that AHEAD trial I mentioned. We have a site uh, locally for people who are interested in participating in that. We do have some lifestyle intervention studies. We have some caregiver intervention studies. We've got uh, memory training studies. We've got imaging and biomarker studies. So really. Uh, a, a wide range and not all of them. I know some people are wary in this COVID era of studies where you have to kind of come in for an in-person visit. Some of them do allow for you know, remote participation. So I've got the, the link here and uh, just Sarah and others at the Alzheimer's Association, I'm happy to have these slides you know, distributed afterwards if people you know, don't have a pen and paper handy to be able to write down these URLs. But this is our URL. If you go to our center website, it has a full listing of these 20 plus studies that are now actively recruiting. So it might be something that either you yourself or maybe a loved one might wanna take a look at because again, the only way we're gonna make progress in the fight against Alzheimer's is through uh, you know, better research that gives us some, some clues on how we might improve uh, treatment prevention and, and caregiving quality of life as well. So I just wanted to kind of offer that plug to our, our center and, and the research studies that, that we're sponsoring. So I wanna, I know it's, you've been listening to me blab on for a while here, but I did wanna make sure, I think we have a little bit of time for some q and I tried to respond to some uh, along the way. Uh, and so maybe I'll, I'll take a, a look at what you've got here. A uh, couple questions about um, uh, amyloid potentially being a protective factor copper zinc ratio in the body uh, factor. Um, those are good questions. I'm actually not probably the best one to answer that. I, I, I've heard about, obviously zinc deficiency is, is a broader concern uh, more generally, but in terms of what it means in terms of uh, risk of Alzheimer's or, or how it might affect somebody with the disease, uh, I'm, I'm not probably the best person to answer that. So I'm, unfortunately, I'll, I'll have to kind of punt on, on that one and. Uh, uh, perhaps others uh, could write in the chat if, if they know themselves. Um, there's a question about Dr. Dale Bredensen's research and publications. And uh, I think this was mentioned earlier. I, I'm a little bit mixed on, on, on his work, to be honest. I think he's, he's obviously a, a very accomplished physician who, who's, who, who knows a, a quite a bit. My, but my thought is that uh, I feel like some have suggested that he perhaps uh, 
goes, goes a little bit too far in, in his claims of, of what's definitely going to work. Um, and so I, I would say you should probably keep some of those recommendations with a, a grain of, of salt in terms of, um, and, and also think about well, what's gonna be, like I try to promote things that we know are, are good for you regardless of not whether they modify risk of, of dementia. And so I think we're on a little safer ground uh, in, in recommending some of these things that, that I've tried to allude to uh, in this talk. Um, but yeah, I don't know, Sarah, if we can open up the mics. So uh, I'm happy to try to continue to respond to, to written questions here, but it might be nice to, to also allow people to just pose questions verbally. Yeah. So they can uh, use the... Oh, absolutely. Uh, people are welcome to continue to use the Q&A, uh, or if you can raise your hand uh, on Zoom, there's a little function at the bottom on your control panel where you should be able to raise your hand, then I'd be happy to go ahead and, and unmute you and can ask your question live. And George, you're stumping me here tonight. I, I really don't know your question about the Seventh Day Adventists. I do not know of any studies that have compared that group to, to others in, in the population. So interesting question, but but I'm not aware of the answer there. Are there um, any questions from, from other folks? Well, I guess, uh, again, kind of in the spirit of promoting um, research, it's not just our center, obviously, that, that sponsors our research studies, but uh, this link here is the NIH, clinicaltrials.gov um, is a website and this specifically focuses on Alzheimer's trials, this URL here. And then I don't know if anybody from the Alzheimer's Association wanted to say anything about your trial match program, because I know that's an exciting program that tries to match people with, with different research projects. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, trial match is a free clinical services matching service uh, where we try to link potential trial participants with trials that might be a good fit based on your location or what stage of the disease you might be at. Uh, or we are also looking for um, neurotypical individuals who aren't experiencing any signs of Alzheimer's or dementia at this point. So I know I'm signed up for trial match. Um, and so we've got information that we'll share in the follow-up email if you're interested in learning a little bit more about that. But that is a nationwide clinical studies matching service. Uh, we did have one more question come in from Deb Roth. Earlier you mentioned with uh, preclinical testing interventions that could begin, what are the most effective interventions? Well, I think the, the jury is still out there because again, a lot of these prevention trials, the data collection is still underway and we, we don't know for sure yet what the results of the trial are. Uh, I think um, that finger trial I mentioned did, that was again in a preclinical population and it did seem to find some early success. Uh, and so that was in, in that intervention, you know, they're using a combination of approaches of diet, physical activity, cognitive training, and then managing um, you know, potential like heart disease risk factors. So that kind of combination of approaches seems to, to um, show some benefit. And then, uh, as I also mentioned earlier, uh, exercise trials have shown some promise uh, as well in this area. So uh, those would be the ones that I would, you know, probably put the most um, faith in, um, in terms of uh, trying to, for someone who might be in more of this preclinical phase, trying to make sure that they don't uh, continue to, to go on to develop Alzheimer's. Yeah, and as Deborah points out, those interventions are promising for everyone. Yeah, for sure. We should all, no matter what our risk status, we should all be trying to be more active, eat well, not smoke, don't drink too heavily, avoid head injuries, you know, be socially engaged. That's just part of uh, hopefully living a, a good life. Uh, uh, so it's a good point there, Deborah. Uh, Renee is mentioning poor dental health could contribute uh, to dementia. Yeah, I've heard you know, some individual studies that suggest that potential link as well. I don't think it's seen as quite as robust a risk factor as some of the others that I, I've mentioned here, but certainly also um, worth uh, considering as well. So, so thanks for, for making that point, Renee. Uh, any other 
questions? I know it's a little bit weird. Hopefully we'll be back in person before too long. It's always, uh, uh, I know it's a little bit awkward trying to interact uh, in Zoom as opposed to, to real life uh, in person. But uh, on the other hand, Zoom really does allow us to uh, reach a broader audience. We found in our Alzheimer's Center events, we're actually getting a lot more people because it's so much more convenient for them to, to log in as opposed to you know drive to Ann Arbor, for example, and find parking. <laughs> Uh, so hopefully uh, th there are some silver linings to, to Zoom life and, and, the, and trying to educate folks uh, this way. So uh, anyway, I, I appreciate your attention. I know it's a, like a, a long time to be listening on a nice day, but hopefully some of this uh, information is useful to you. And, um, and then uh, I think uh, hopefully, like I said, I'm happy to have these slides uh, shared with the, the broader uh, audience as well, uh, because again, some of this stuff, um, you know, I tried to provide some links to, to additional resources. Um, Thank you so much. So, so much for sharing your expertise. We will uh, share the slides in the coming days. Uh, we'll also share a survey so you can provide some feedback uh, and then we invite you to do that. And we will, this is normally where we would share our door prize, uh, but we'll be announcing that on our social media channels on June 1st. So if you weren't aware, if you attended uh, this evening's presentation or for those who are attending uh, our next research update, we will be offering some gift cards uh, and we'll announce those again, the winners on June 1st in our social media channels. Um, and I don't believe I see any more questions in the chat at this point. So thank you so much again, Dr. Roberts, always a pleasure. And we so appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us this evening. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And uh, I'll look forward to connecting with you guys on Friday for round two. That's great. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great evening. Take care. Take care.